In Star Trek Online, engineers are generally looked at the least favorably of the three classes. Tactical is generally regarded as the best because it's the best at damage, but is also very suitable for doing literally everything else. Science is also fairly favorable because of its ability to have some extra debuffs on, on builds, and it's also got um, a, sub, a subnucleonic beam, which is really great for disabling certain abilities that are really annoying, like the uh, the Borg Queen's uh, reverse shield polarity ability in, uh, in the Hive. But while engineers seem to have been originally envisioned as the tanking class for Star Trek Online, they've never really filled that role all that well, especially in comparison to the other two. But there is one thing that engineers have always excelled at, and that is ground combat. So today, we are going to be talking about the engineering ground combat meta. Now, I know a lot of you don't really care all that much about the meta. Trust me, I've seen your comments. Many of them were quite rude. But I do get that not everyone is out here to live that Pokemon dream of being the very best like no one ever was. But I've always felt that it's important to have at least some understanding of the meta, because understanding the game's meta is understanding how this game works, and understanding about how to properly put together a build. You don't have to strictly follow the meta, but understanding it and using at least parts of it are really useful for improving your own original builds. And going into another reason why you probably aren't going to be into this video, um, I know ground combat is the most popular thing, but at the same time, I've generally found that people who don't like ground combat all that much are just people who really haven't found a ground build that they like, or are people who struggle with ground combat because they don't have a, a ground build that is strong enough to keep up. So if you're like me and you main an engineer, maybe this could be helpful for you. Anyway, I have used up enough time for this intro, let's get to the build. Now, as I said, this is going to be covering the DPS ground meta for engineering characters. Unlike with space combat, there are still some substantial differences between the different classes when it comes to ground combat, largely due to how many unique kit modules there are for each, for each class. So this setup is really only going to be useful for an engineering character. Additionally, this build is designed for setting DPS record runs in ground TFOs, particularly in Bug Hunt Elite, and thus is also optimized to work in tandem with a number of other players that are running support builds. Those support builds designed to both buff one player on the team as well as debuffing the enemies that spawn in. If you're interested in finding out how ground support builds work, I know Augmented Dictator Games is going to be uploading one about an hour after this one goes live. In fact, Augie was running that build in the Bug Hunt Elite that you'll see later in the video. So be sure to check that out. But the whole support build thing is really only required if you are trying to set a record on the DPS leaderboards. So even under normal circumstances when you're probably not running with a team full of players running support builds, this build will still perform very well. Meaning it's also very useful for elite random TFOs. Now getting onto the actual build, we'll start with the kit modules and these first two kit modules are the main reason why we're using this on an engineer. First off is Chronoton Mine Barrier. This is a very common kit module for engineers. It can drop randomly in loot, engineers can craft it, you can also get it from several fleet locations. It's a very easy kit module to pick up and it can be quite powerful. How it works is that it will spawn five Chronoton Mines right in front of you. There's a small delay for them to activate, about four seconds, and then they will stay there for about 60 seconds. And if anything gets within 1.5 meters of them, they will explode, dealing a good amount of kinetic damage. The key with this thing is getting familiar with the spawn points on TFOs. Once you know where the enemies are going to spawn in, you know immediately where you want to set your mines down. Then the enemies will just spawn right in on them, and then they will immediately explode and just immediately die. It's pretty much the same story with the next kit module here, Cloaked Mine Barrier. These work pretty much the same, their mines are cloaked and will actually spawn an extra mine in another location, so that way you have a chance for a little extra kinetic damage in case someone wanders off. While the initial damage from the Cloaked Mine Barrier is a little bit more powerful than the Chronoton Mine Barrier, the Chronoton Mine Barrier has a much lower cooldown. So you are going to be able to spam the first one more often, but it is still beneficial to have both. Cloaking Mine Barrier is available to engineers through a project in the Gamma Reputation. Now, there is actually one more kit module that is also a Mine Barrier. It's an episode reward in somewhere in the Klingon Civil War arc. Ah, it's from A Day Long Remembered, and it is the Tetrion Mine Barrier. And while these are okay, especially because these are actually uh, a universal kit module, so any any class can use these, but I guess that's part of the trade-off, because while it is a universal kit, they're not as powerful as the Chronoton or the Cloaking Mines. Additionally, they are more optimized for shield penetration rather than just normal DPS. And in the case of Bug Hunt Elite, the bugs don't have shields, so shield penetration really isn't going to do you any good. 
but yeah, just wanted to point this one out because I knew if I didn't, people were going to be like, um, you missed one, but no, I didn't miss one. It's just not there on purpose. The rest of these kit modules drop from the infinity lock boxes and are also available on the exchange. The first one being Bowl Obelisk Network. You guys have probably seen me talk about this one before. It is a very powerful kit module that spa that can spawn up to three turret-like constructs. They shoot powerful beam weapons out of your enemies, and when in range of each other, they will link together, making each turret more powerful. Now, the real power in the Bowl Obelisk Network is that they are capable of linking together with other players' obelisks as well. So while one player gets a maximum of three, if every player on the team is using this kit module, you can link up to 15 of these things, which can result in some crazy high max one hits. However, for the purpose of the record run that you're gonna see later, I'll be the only one using the Bowel Obelisk because the danger of linking them together is that you never know who's gonna get credit for the kill. So for the purpose of record runs, you generally wanna be the only one running this kit module. I know some people do chance it and let the supports run this kit module too, just for the sake of trying to add power to their own obelisks, but at the same time, you do run the risk of that power going to one of the supports, which is going to mess up your record run. Next up is the Explosive Soong Drones. Now, you remember the old Explosive Drone kit module? It's kind of like that, except it spawns in three drones instead of one, and they don't have that sustained anti-proton beam, which really doesn't do that much damage anyway. So, in case something gets away from the spawn points of your mind barriers, you've got this to fly after them. The next module is called Gravitational Juncture. It's basically a big AoE pull. It'll put down a big circle around you and take a little bit to charge up and then it'll pull anything within its radius to the center of it. This one is very helpful if you're not super familiar with the spawn points of the TFOs because this way you can just pull enemies into your mine barriers. Now there is also Gravity Containment Unit which is another kit module that's good for pulling enemies into a certain direction. However, the Gravity Containment Unit is more of a directional pull because it is a cone-shaped attack whereas Gravitational Juncture is a larger circular shape. So it's going to have more coverage and it's going to be capable of pulling in more enemies into your mines than just the Gravitational Containment Unit. And the last one is Agony Field Generator. Now, honestly, I find this kit module to be more annoying than anything else. It feels kind of cheap, but there is no denying that it is exceptionally powerful. It has a very big AoE that draws in toward its spawn point and is very useful for killing any enemies that get too far away from you. Oh, actually, there's another kit module I should also talk about. Uh, this one's called Transphasic Bomb. Transphasic Bomb is, well, it's basically what it sounds like. It's a bomb. It deals a bunch of AoE kinetic damage. It can be very powerful, but the thing with Transphasic Bomb is you have to manually trigger it, so timing with it can be kind of tricky. And it only has a 7.5 meter range, so it's really not going to have as much coverage as, say, the Agony Field Generator or even the Baul Obelisks. But if you've really got those enemy spawn locations down, this would be a really good kit module to use. I don't have that much faith in my memory, however, so I went with the Baul Obelisk instead. Alternatively, if you're not super worried about range, you could go with Ball Lightning instead. Actually, it would also make a reasonable substitute for the Baul Obelisk as well. But yeah, Ball Lightning, which is available from the Summer Event vendor. But yeah, also a very powerful kit module and would synergize very well with the kit frame that we're using, but at the same time, I have found this setup to be better. Again, just one of those things that I thought might be worth mentioning. Especially considering that I am also using the Ryzean kit frame, which is also available from the Summer Event vendor. The reason that you want to use the Ryzean kit frame is because it is one of the very small handful of kit frames that can be re-engineered. More than that, it is one of the few that are able to be re-engineered to Kperf 3. Kperf is the kit performance stat, and it is generally the most important stat for any ground build, because that is going to determine the strength of your kit modules. Now, there is a trick to getting Kperf 3 on the Ryzean kit because normally most kit modules can't have anything above Kperf 2, even the ones that can be re-engineered. For the Ryzean kit frame, what you want to do is just throw it in the upgrade menu after you buy it, just so it goes from Infinite Mark to Mark 12. Once you have it at Purple Quality Mark 12, then you can re-engineer it to Kperf 2, and then you upgrade it because once you get it to Ultra Rare, that Ultra Rare mod will automatically be Kperf. That is where your third Kperf will come in. And then once you get it to Epic, you have the guaranteed Kperf slash weapon mod, which that one's always on every kit module, so technically you get it up to Kperf 4, but I generally don't count the Epic mod because it's guaranteed. The Rising kit frame also has a special effect of anytime you activate one of these Summer Event kit modules, you have a 20% chance to trigger any of the other Summer Event kit modules, whether you have them equipped or not. Which is why I also gave the alternative suggestion of throwing in Ball Lightning instead of Bowel Obelisk or the Agony Field Generator. It could work out for you, but it is going to be very RNG-focused because, as I said, you're only going to have the one, so you only have a 20% chance. 
it could work out in your favor, but I have found that this setup works better more consistently. The rest of the gear is going to be fairly consistent with what you've seen on some of my other ground builds. Uh, first is Burnham CQC armor, which gives some extra crit chance of crit severity, and also some run speed, which is nice. This is available from the Discovery Reputation. Then we've got the Nakul Temporal Operative Personal Shield. This is an episode reward from the Temporal Front, which is in the Future Proof arc. This has a really useful time slip ability, which is good for increasing your survivability. However, when running with four support players, that's really not going to be an issue here, so really we're just using this for the two-piece bonus, which I am getting by keeping the weapon from the Nakul set in my offhand. The Nakul weapon is just here for the sake of the two-piece bonus, I never switch to it for the sake of using it as a weapon. The two-piece grants some extra crit chance and crit severity, which is helpful for increasing your damage. The weapon I am actually using is the Portable Phaser Cannon Special Issue from the Lobi Store, or what the community commonly calls the Shax Cannon. We call it that because its first and only appearance was in Star Trek Lower Decks, and has only ever been seen used by Lieutenant Shax. It's also much faster and easier to say than Portable Phaser Cannon Special Issue. This has always been a very powerful ground weapon ever since it was first introduced into the Lobi Store. You could swap this out for other powerful weapons that are also available in the Lobi Store, like the Boolean Cannon, or even the old Herald Staff. However, your choice of weapon really isn't going to matter all that much, largely because most of your damage is going to be coming from your kit modules. In fact, you'll see in the run I do later, I barely have time to even fire my weapon because I'm so focused on spamming my kit modules. There are some instances where the weapon is useful, like where you just want to kill one enemy that's kind of wandered off and it's out of range of your kit modules, and you want to kill it fast, but for the most part, you're going to want to focus on spamming your kits. In the device slots, really only two of these are actually important. First are the large kit overboosters, which are a craftable consumable. You gotta get your kits and modules R&D school to, I think it's level 10, and then you'll be able to craft these. Though they can also be sold in the exchange, so if you're still leveling up your R&D schools, that is also an option. These will give further buffs to your kit performance skill, which, like I said earlier, kit performance is a very important skill for ground. And they can also reduce the cooldown of your kit modules, which is going to be important because, unlike most of my ground builds, I am not using MUD's time device on this. The other important one here is the gambling device, which can be obtained from the low buy store, but is also sellable in the exchange. It can be a bit annoying when it fails, but that plus 10% to crit chance of crit severity is too good to pass up. I have often suggested the rainbow triple as an alternative to the gambling device in the past, but for the sake of this build, for the sake of trying to set records on certain TFOs, for the sake of DPS runs, you really want to be running the gambling device, especially because those support players will probably already be using the Rainbow Tribble, so you'll be getting that buff anyway. Now, beyond those two, there really isn't much else that's going to offer much benefit in the devices. I've got three combat pet devices in here, which they can be useful just because you can spawn them and just let them do their thing, but even then, you'll see on the parts they really didn't do that much damage. But with how much debuff is being applied from the support players, things just die way too quickly for the pets to even be able to react. So they might be useful if you're just running random TFOs, but if you're running actual support runs for the sake of trying to do records, these really aren't going to do all that much. So just pick the ones you like and don't worry about it. For the specializations, I am running Temporal as the primary. Temporal's inevitability skill is useful for lowering the recharge time of my kit modules, and modular momentum can be good for lowering the cooldown of your secondary firing mode on your weapon. Assuming you're using that much, which in this case you probably won't be, but at the same time it's still kind of nice to have. For the secondary, I was using Commando, it's got a lot of decent ground buffs, though a lot of them are incorporated into the crouching and aiming mechanic, but really, overall, there really isn't anything else that's going to be super useful for ground, at least as a secondary, so really I guess I just gotta get better about using the aiming mechanic. Okay, moving on to the personal ground traits, first we have the ground version of Adaptive Offense. Just like its space counterpart, it is a stacking crit chance buff that turns into a crit severity buff and then back. Next is Adrenaline Rush, which actually functions more like a click ability, which you can see it right down here on my bar. Click it, and you get plus 50% to all outgoing damage. You do also take a penalty to damage resistance, but again, with all the support players, that's not going to be a problem. Bombardier, which is giving a plus 10% bonus to kinetic damage, which that's going to be buffing my mines. Creative, which is just a straightforward buff to kit performance. Hive Mind, which gives 2% bonus all damage per every teammate within 20 meters and that bonus is doubled if any of those teammates are also using Hivemind. So under normal circumstances, that is a minimum of a 20% bonus damage buff as long as everyone remains within 20 meters of each other, but you can get that up to 40% if everyone is using this personal trait. Next is Orbital Devastation. This is an engineering exclusive personal trait that will turn your orbital strike into an orbital chasing beam. Normally I find this trait to be very useful for buffing orbital strike, but you'll see in the demonstration, I hardly had any time to actually use this ability, 
So honestly, I may have been better off with something that further buffed my kit performance or kit readiness, like Serenity or Field Technician. Shadow Over the Black Mountain. This is another one that everyone on the team should be using because it gives kit performance to everyone on the team. As long as you don't die. If you do die, then the buff goes away and it won't reset until a map move. But again, with a support run, survival really shouldn't be that much of an issue. Next is Space Explorer is a pretty great gig. With this, you will get a kit performance buff that is equal to 20% of your kit readiness skill, as well as giving its own buff to kit readiness. Next is Technophile, and with this equipped, you will gain a plus 100 to kit performance every time you use a kit module. The buff will last for 8 seconds and has a 24 second lockout. So you won't have that buff for very long, but you'll be able to get it back pretty quick. And plus 100 kit performance is a lot of kit performance. Next is Upgraded Gear, which gives you plus 2.5 kit performance for every time you defeat an enemy and can stack up to plus 50. This will reset every time you've been defeated or if you move maps. And the last personal ground trait on here is Vicious. For every 6 seconds you are in combat, you get a plus 1.5% to bonus all damage and plus 6% to crit severity, and that will stack up to 5 times. In the ground reputation traits, I'm using Deadly Aim for the extra crit severity, Magnified Armaments for the bonus all damage buff, Miniaturized Chrono Capacitor for some extra recharge time reduction on my kit modules, Personal Energy Amplifier, which will give some extra bonus damage to my kit module abilities, and Strength of Body, which will give me some extra kit performance for 15 seconds every time I use a Captain's ability. For the Duty Officers, a lot of their buffs are fairly generalized because there really isn't much that buffs this specific sort of build. First is Elder Malakatan, which is awarded from the Gamma Recruitment event. He's good for buffing damage on both ground and space at the same time. Three Assault Squad officers that are buffing my crit chance and or crit severity anytime I fire a ranged weapon, which really aren't going to be all that useful just because we're not going to be firing our ranged weapons all that much, at least I wasn't in my run. But unfortunately, there really aren't many duty officers that have any effect on kit performance. Next is a security officer that has a chance for my Chronoton Mines to trigger a hold ability on enemies. This can be useful on anything that just happens to survive any of your mines, but honestly that's not going to happen all that often. Just because the mines are already so powerful, and with all the debuff going on from the support players, yeah, there's going to be a lot of one-hit kills. But in case anything does survive, you want to hold them still just to unload another set of mines on them. And last is a biochemist that reduces the recharge time of your stims, shield capacitors, or power cells. So that is going to include my large kit over booster devices. One last thing I should note before going into the demonstration and the parse analysis for this build is that I am using a spam bar on this ground build. That's not something I've often done on ground builds in the past, but for the sake of this build, I am doing that. My number two bar ability over here, that is my spam bar. I have that bound to one of my side mouse buttons, so it makes them very easy to set off very quickly. But you can see I've got the large kit over boosters here, so I'm getting that uh, kit performance buff. And then we just spam right through the kit modules. And I threw support drone in there as well, because that's a good one to just make sure you have out all the time. It's not going to do a huge amount of damage, but at the same time, it is still a pet. It'll fight alongside you, so you may as well let it do its thing. Plus, that way I know I have something that is triggering strength of body. Anyway, that's the build, so let's move on to the demonstration. This run of Bug Hunt Elite was set up during a live stream on Pirate Scum Gaming's channel. He was doing a night dedicated to record runs, so we all kind of took the opportunity to uh, get some records done. If you're not already following Pirate Scum Gaming over on Twitch, you definitely should go check him out. I know he wants to do more nights dedicated to support record runs, so if you want to get your own record in, he might be able to help you out. Anyway, I wasted enough time with this. Anyway, I have used up enough time for this intro, let's get to the build.
With this build, paired with a team of players all running support builds, I was able to do 14k in Bug Hunt Elite. And again, that is because everyone else is running support, so they are dedicated to either buffing me or debuffing the enemies. You can see most of my damage did come from pet damage, but the Chronoton Mind Barrier wasn't far behind that. And then the Cloaking Mind Barrier, not far behind them. And this Cloak Mind Barrier 1, I'm pretty sure that's the extra mine that you get along with it. So again, that's being counted twice, so overall this did about the same amount as the, uh, the Chronoton Mines. Of the pet damage, most of that did come from the Baul Obelisk doing almost 3000 DPS. Like I said, even with other players not using them, these are still very powerful. I was actually a little disappointed with Agony Field, only doing 696 DPS. Though really the big advantage with Agony Field is its range, so you're able to pick off any stragglers that may have wandered off. Or in the case of Bug Hunt, able to pick off any enemies that have accidentally clipped through the wall. But that said, maybe I should do a little bit more playing around with Ball Lightning or Transphasic Bomb. So yeah, that is the Engineering DPS Ground Meta. Uh, be sure to let me know what you thought of the build down below, and do remember that this was a supported run in the uh, the Bug Hunt Elite demonstration. Uh, that's why I was doing so much damage and why everyone else was doing so little damage. They were running builds specifically meant to support my damage, but even without those builds, this thing still does a lot of damage, so it's not necessary to have support characters uh, following you around to buff your damage in order for this thing to do well. It just, they do better with them, and that was the whole point because that run was meant to be a, uh, a record run for the DPS leaderboards. If you are interested in finding out how ground support builds work, uh, don't forget that Augmented Dictator Games is going to have his own build video on how those work on his channel, which should be up in an, about an hour after this goes live, so uh, be sure to check that out when you have the chance. But let me know what you thought of this build down below in the comments, and while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. If you would like to further support the channel, you can hit that join button to become a member, or you can find the uh, link to the merch store down there, or if you are ever shopping on the Epic Game Store, you can use my uh, my creator code, STU1701, helps me out, and I really do appreciate that. Or if you're ever looking for Star Trek models on real merch, I have an affiliate link, which should be in the description, and I also have a discount code over there, which is also STU1701, which will get you 10% off your order. Either way though, thank you so much for watching. My name is Stu and I will see you guys next time.